This is Bible Academy. We are in the book of Philippians. Now before we continue in our book, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we have yielded ourselves to the Holy Spirit, that He might control our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity we have to study your word today. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. By way of review, let's go back and read our first three verses of chapter 3. Furthermore, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, watch out for the evil workers, watch out for the mutilators of the flesh. For we are the true circumcision, who serve in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in in the flesh. In verse 4, Paul turns this argument around and takes the position of putting confidence in the flesh. That is to look at one's human achievements by citing who he was and what he had done. Verse 4. Although I myself have good reason to put confidence even in the flesh, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. It's as if Paul lays down a challenge to the Judaizers, to the legalist. Who has more to, most, to boast about than me? When I was a Pharisaical Jew, so in verse 5, Paul begins to list those accomplishments in the flesh. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. Paul says he was circumcised on the eighth day. This was exactly in accordance to the Mosaic Law, Leviticus 12.3. So he had met the standard of being a Jew, of following the law since he was a baby. Unlike one who might be a proselyte or some late comer to Judaism. He also writes he is of the people of Israel not a proselyte, through and through Israelite blood. Both parents of the Jewish line. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was considered the most faithful tribe to the line of David. That was when the, when the kingdom divided. So even the tribe he came from was renowned. King Saul, the first king, was from Benjamin, after whom Paul was named. Benjamin, as a tribe, stood out as uh, the one, well, Benjamin himself, let's talk about him. He was the offspring of Jacob's first wife, favorite wife. The Feast of Purim commemorated the national deliverance of Mordecai or Benjamin. Now, they had their line of disappointment, if we, of course, think about Saul and how he ended up. But Benjamin, as a tribe, had quite a history, very much embedded in Jewish history and heritage. So to say that one was from the tribe of Benjamin 
he was saying that he was very much part of Israel and their history and heritage. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Now this can mean several things. Uh, raised in the culture. Knew the languages, both Hebrew and Aramaic. But it probably means more than anything that he met every standard and trait one might expect a Hebrew to be. And then he says, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. This was the most orthodox of the Jewish sects, with the most zealous supporters and interpreters of the Mosaic law. Let me say that again. To call himself a Pharisee. This was the most orthodox of the Jewish sects and the most zealous supporters and interpreters of the Mosaic Law. In addition, Paul had studied under one of the most celebrated teachers, Gamaliel, Acts 22.3. As Saul of Tarsus, there is no mention of anyone who had the bloodline, the credentials, and training that this man had. Saul had a great Jewish history behind him. He could not have been outdone. Verse 6. Now let's talk about his actual life. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, blameless. You talk for zeal, we talk about zeal, you talk about one's enthusiasm and motivation. So much so that he was one of the great persecutors of the church. Paul, as a Pharisee, Saul, had become the arch enemy of the church, condemning Christians and persecuting them, very zealous for the legalistic, fleshly controlled religion of Judaism, before he became Paul. We hear something of his record. In Acts nineteen, or excuse me, Acts nine twenty one. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, "Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem, among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest?" You see, that was his practice. He would hear of those who would be Christians and go into their homes and take them to the chief priest so they could be judged. So here we see one of the manifestations of legalistic Judaism and evil out to persecute the church at one of its critical periods. And then he says, as for the righteousness based on the law, when it came to gaining one's own righteousness by keeping the law, which is the way of the legalist, call Paul, Saul kept the letter of the law as well as any man could. He was considered blameless. In the eyes of Judaism, Saul was not making errors. Think of it. Considered blameless, though he persecuted Christians. Now, the reason I mention that is because let's begin to think in terms of what was right. Blameless was all about outward conformity to the law, plus the traditions and the additions that they added to the law. So after this short list of achievements, though they were big, this accomplished man in the world of Judaism 
now gives his view of these great achievements, but now he looks at them as a believer saved by grace. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So after he pulls out all his trophies and medals and his ribbons and the plaques that say how well he has done, those things I've counted as loss. Whatever things, this phrase, covers those things that would be considered positive and good for a Judaizer. In the world of legalism, Judaism, and Pharisaism, he had built a mountain of good works and the profit column and their system of works toward what they deemed as righteousness before God. Let's put it this way. If we were to make a ledger, on one side you have profit, on the other you have loss. Mm -hmm. Paul had one thing after another in the profit column. Judaism. His credentials were impeccable. His record was impeccable. His zeal, well, there's no one mentioned who matched his zeal. One of his top activities demonstrating his zeal was persecuting Christians. Now, as a believer, do it this way. Now, as a believer, all these things that were counted as a as profit are now loss. for the sake of Christ. Paul had built, as Saul, so many good works that no one compared to him. That's what he did. That's what he was known for. That's what he led in doing. And when it came to zeal and persecution that was a pretty th big thing. He was willing to go out there and have Christians arrest arrested, persecuted, and even put to death. Listen to Acts 8.3. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Two big actions here. He began to destroy the church. He destroyed the church by destroying the people. If it meant to break up the assemblies or break up the families, uh, break up the leadership, that's what you would go after. He would have him and his men go into the houses, drag off men and women, and put them into prison. Paul as Saul excelled as a legalistic Pharisee. And as we see here, one of his objectives was to destroy Christianity. The very people who had the message of true righteousness. He says 
those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. All of that was loss. Now let's keep this in perspective because he's doing this for a reason. These things that were so big in Judaism put him in the negative column. All those works, all those self-imposed restrictions he put upon himself, keeping the details of not only law, but all the added rules and regulations this legalistic system had, they all go over to the lost column on this balanced ledger, including all these bonus points for persecuting Christians. Now, what I'm trying to impress upon you is that this was his life. This was the direction. This was the goals in life. This is what he worked for to stomp out Christianity. Now, he lays this out before his reading audience so they can see where he had been and what he had done. Let's get it all out there. Let's get all the things out there that legalists and Judaizers do and show you what it's worth. It's all a loss. So, when it came to gaining God's righteousness, now here's what I really want you to follow. When it comes to gaining God's righteousness, what's required of entrance in heaven, what God gives to every believer, all these things that he accomplished got him further and further and further away. They got him further away from true righteousness. Bad works plus bad works equals bad works. So when you add up everything he had done, they come up to bad works. No righteousness. The Bible tells us that the unbeliever will be judged for his works when the books are opened. Revelation 20.12 And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Then books were opened, and another book was opened, the book of life. So the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to their deeds. That word is the same word for works. Now, if we put two and two together, they're judged according to their works. And we know that all these works done in the flesh are bad works. Then that would amount to a more severe judgment. Or at least no possibility of receiving any righteousness or any credit. Just the opposite of what many religious people think. The Book of Life was the list of everyone's name at the beginning, and then as people died without Christ, their name would be scratched off. So what would happen is, or the procedure here is to look at the Book of Life, that, name, that person died without Christ. His name is scratched out already. Probably when he died, in keeping with the analogy. And then they open the book of 
works to look at all his human righteous acts and that would demonstrate further this person's unbelief don't miss that all these works based on human achievement they're also based upon unbelief lack of faith how do we know that because we get God's righteousness by faith. True righteousness comes by faith. So, every work by every unbeliever adds up in the loss column. The more the works, the more the loss, the more the judgment. Now I want us to see something before we move on to verse 8. One more thing. Verse 7 again, let's look at this first phrase I mentioned. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. The whatever things cover those things that would be considered positive and good for a Judaizer. It included everything that Paul as Saul did in the flesh as a Pharisee. Now he's going to take this up a notch. When he starts out in verse 7 and says, excuse me, starts out in verse 8 and says, More than that, I count all things, not just whatever things, but all things to be a loss because of the surpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. When Paul says more than that, more than the whatever things that were gainful under the legalistic system, he now says I count all things, not just whatever things I did as a Pharisee, but all things. Anything and everything anyone could do is a loss when compared to the surpassing worth the word for surpassing worth hooper echo it means excellence surpassing or excelling value. The surpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Let's look at this word knowledge. It's in the singular. The whatever things and all things were in the plural what we saw in the, earlier in this verse and the previous verse. All those things, everything, is not worth the single thing of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Now, when you look at all the dozens of things he did over the many years, counting what he was since he was a baby, They don't compare to the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus. They don't compare. Now, folks, let me make sure you understand what I'm saying. To put this in today's terms, all the good works, all the human good, everything that everybody does, they can have in mind trying to please God or do what's best for the world or for the country or for themselves or for their family. If you were to take all those things, none of them compare to the knowledge, the surpassing excellence of the knowledge 
of Christ Jesus. Now I know as human beings and as believers we hear stories of someone doing something heroic or above and beyond what most people would do. They save someone from a car wreck. They, they, uh, they die for the cause or they sacrifice money or something for others. The world calls that good. Remember, it's the world that calls it good. Now, to take any of those acts and think it pleases God is unjustifiable. If one does not accept his son, then he, no matter how heroic, will end up into the lake of fire. Well, you mean to say that whatever anybody does that's good is really not any good? Not when it comes to pleasing God. The object of the comparison of all those things is the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Let's look at the word knowledge, a term we see often in Scripture. The Greek is gnosis. Transliteration is G, N, and then it's a long O. O sound, gnosis, knowledge. Knowledge of Christ is of a supreme importance to the believer. It's the knowledge of Christ by which one is initially saved. It's knowledge of Christ by which we grow spiritually. 2 Peter 3.8 But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. This is a picture of the Roman victory procession where the victors would walk through the streets in a parade and they would toss out flowers or some fragrant uh, fragrance flower of sorts and people could smell it and they could enjoy the enjoy the parade here the analogy is to the fragrance of the knowledge the word gnosis again of him we are victors and one of the things we share as victors and appreciate from our Lord is knowledge of Jesus Christ. Back to our verse. Paul continues to write, For whom I have lost all things. So when he says, I count all things to be a loss because of the surpassing worth of, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He then says, For whom I have suffered the loss of all 
things. The word for loss, zemi ao. Z e m i o long o. It means to experience the loss of something. Here, <clears throat> the subject receives the action. Now, some tra translators will put the term suffered in their translation to reflect that because it's the subject that is receiving the action, so they enter the word suffer. How do you express uh, someone losing something? The act is upon him, so they put the word suffer in there. I prefer the translation, for whom I have lost. Now, he's the loser. That's the point. For whom I have lost all things. But to put suffer in, some might imply some sense of regret, and that's not here at all. There's no sense of regret. So, for Christ, for whom I have lost all things. Everything he had amounted to for a good part of his life is all viewed as lost. But as I said, there is not only no sense of regret but now he counts them as rubbish. Paul has the believer's view on this now. All the things he did, all the works he accomplished, are rubbish. The word for rubbish, well, it's kind of a mild translation. Uh, rubbish is... Skubalon, it means refuse, dung, excrement, garbage. Paul's making a big contrast here, obviously, perhaps for shock effect. You know all that stuff I did as a Pharisee for 20 years, however long it was? All those credentials I had as a Jew? All those studies I did, all those accomplishments, all those laws and traditions I enforced, that's all garbage. Those accomplishments, those human achievements that people look up, or they look up to, that one might boast about, are considered as low a thing as one can imagine. They are dung. Now that should put a different perspective on legalism for you. We've talked about legalism quite a bit in my teaching of the epistles and Galatians and now in Philippians. Not only the evils of legalism, but what a waste. What a waste. Why does he count them as rubbish? So that I may gain Christ. That's the next phrase. So that I may gain Christ. All those human righteous acts had to be put out of his life. Out of one's mind. So that human accomplishes, accomplishment is completely out of the way. So he could gain Christ and accept the grace of God. Now this has a broad application as you begin to sort out in your own life what is human good, what is considered great human accomplishment. It usually doesn't amount to anything. When it comes to the righteousness of God, it amounts to nothing. Now, I leave some leeway there for people to make of their own evaluation of what they do as a Christian. Uh, you can pretty much forget everything you did as an unbeliever because that was a waste. 
There was no gain in that whatsoever. But sometimes Christians will continue on to do things when they become Christians. That didn't contradict itself, did I? Did I? When you when you have done something as an unbeliever and you continue to do it as a Christian, uh, it can actually be legitimate if it's the will of God, like have a job or raise your family or discipline your children. When you move over into the Christian realm, those things are good in the eyes of God. What do I mean by that? Well, someone raises their kids right as a right as, as an unbeliever. Now, what does that mean? Well, they discipline them. They're not criminals. They have good manners and courtesy. And that's all fine and good. But it does nothing towards righteousness. Nothing towards pleasing God. You can't please God in the flesh. And you might say, well, they raised their kids right. Well, that depends what you mean by right, you see. So let's make sure that we understand we can't do anything righteous apart from being a believer and having God's righteousness. All the best work that's been done without God, without Christ, even without the Spirit in one's life is really waste product. I think that might be one of the more difficult principles for believers to understand and apply. Uh, we're in a huge political sis, uh, season right now in the United States where we have some, on the one hand, we have some pretty clear contrast. On the other hand, there's huge problems with both sides. So one has a difficult time even deciding if he wants to get involved in this because it's so corrupt at this point. Of course, that's a decision every believer has to make. Now, we know we're not going to save the world. We're not going to improve the world. And if we could, we're improving it for the devil. Give that some thought. Because he is the one that's in control of this evil cosmos system. We are citizens of heaven. That is what we're bound for and that is what we live for. That doesn't mean we don't stand for justice and truth and doing the right things. But when it comes to thinking that we can improve all of this by a vote, or by supporting certain candidates, we need to consider all what's going on. Well, enough of that for now, but let's move on to verse 9, where Paul continues with the purpose of this loss. The purpose of this loss. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but through the faith of Christ, the righteousness from God by faith. Let me go back to verse 8 and read that again. I can see that as I read this now, we might be losing some continuity. Let's go back to 8. I'll read 8 again and just pick up with verse 9. More than that, I count all things to be a loss because of the surpassing worth of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, so that I might so that I may gain Christ <clears throat> and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but through the faith of Christ, 
the righteousness from God by faith. So, not only that he may gain Christ, he's counting these things as loss, so that he may gain Christ and be found in him. Eris passive subjunctive of Eurisco. You may have heard the word Eureka, I found it. Eurisco, Eurisco. To be better pronounced with the heavy breathing here on the uh, EU sound, Eurisco, to find out by experience or thought. To be found in Him includes in union in Christ, in union with Christ. That's one of the ideas behind be found in Him. This is one of the goals of Paul's life that at the end, he's in union with Christ. The subjunctive mood, again, is potential. And add to that, not having a righteousness from the law, from my own, of my own, that comes from the law. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Paul makes it clear that all that stuff he worked for since he was young, the goals he accomplished, studying under the best, ranking high yet so long, young, keeping the law plus, that righteousness was all wrong, nothing good about it. In contrast, but through the faith of Christ, let me put this up here with an alternate translation, but through the faith of Christ or Christ's faithfulness, this is a subjunctive genitive. If you're with me in Galatians, you saw it in Galatians 2.16 and 20 and 3.22. It has to do with describing Christ. Christ is faithful. It's his faithfulness. He was the faithful Christ. Christ was totally faithful in obedience to the Father and his plan, which made it possible for us that believing in him, we receive his righteousness. Now the genitive basically is translated, we use the English word of. So, but through the faith of Christ, not faith in Christ, that's not what this is referring to. To put this another way, this is the basis or the grounds of our faith, of who Christ was, the faithful one. And then we have the phrase, after that, the righteousness from God by faith. So, Christ's faithfulness was the basis of our righteousness, a righteousness we get from God by faith. There are many scriptures that confirm that we receive righteousness from God and by faith. Romans 4, 5, and 6. But the one who does not work, that's pretty clear, isn't it? But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. You know, one of the more difficult things for religious people to do, those who were raised, their parents brought them up, perhaps their parents' parents, they've been surrounded in a legalistic church all their life. One of the most difficult things for them to do is that they can't gain 
righteousness from works. It's hard for them to realize that they can't gain righteousness on their own. Because it's been instilled into them to be good. To act righteously. God is not pleased with you, Johnny. Do what God wants you to do, Mary. And so, all their lives, from being a child, they think being good pleases God. When in fact, what we've learned is none of those acts out of the flesh pleases God. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Let's look at it this way. As an unbeliever, you have no righteousness. There is no way you can gain God's righteousness by works. Works don't work. You see, what you've got to understand, for one thing, as someone who is an unbeliever, he is unrighteous. Now, we can put it simply. Everything an unrighteous person produces is unrighteous. Everything a sinner produces falls short of God's high standard. So, what does God do? We'll just take it's Jesus. When you trust in Jesus through faith, God gives you righteousness so now you're righteous and in the power of the spirit you produce good works in the eyes of God and the only way you can receive that righteousness is through faith Genesis 15, 6 starts, uh, speaks of Abraham, who's the pattern in the Old Testament. Romans 3, 22, Romans 4, 22. Let me read verses 7 through 9 without the verse break at this point. Philippians 7 through 9. I shouldn't have said Romans. I'm just, we were just in Romans. Philippians 7 through 9. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom or for whose sake I lost all things and count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but through the faith of Christ. That's Christ's faithfulness. The righteousness from God by faith. So, that puts all the thoughts together in one paragraph. 
one more time. For whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I lost all things and count them as rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but through the faith of Christ. That's Christ's faithfulness, the righteousness from God by faith. Well, verse 10 continues the next purpose, so we might call goal, and that's where we'll continue next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege we've had to study your word today. Lord, help us understand what it means to be righteous, how our righteousness is received from you, and that in the flesh we can do nothing. Help us sort out what is good works and bad works and begin to think them through as we go about our daily lives. We ask for your discernment that we might apply your word and the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.